Welcome back. Now, it took eight years and hundreds of police officers to finally track down triple child killer Robert Black. The Scottish van driver is now serving life behind bars for the three murders, but many senior police officers believe he could be linked to even more child killings. Black was a ruthless, evil man, but also a lucky one, staying one step ahead of the police for nearly a decade. Six police forces hunted Robert Black for eight years. He is a most peculiar man, and in my view, a man of the most evil kind. He must be the biggest child serial killer that we've had in the United Kingdom, certainly during the 39 years that I've been in the police service. He was 47, he was a van driver, and he had a criminal record. A warning had even been made on his file that he travelled the country. Throughout his life he'd been a prolific sexual offender, but those who knew him suspected nothing. I mean, to think that he'd come back off the trip and come into the pub from the trip and play darts. And we think about, I mean, the people down in the pub I go to, that the little girl could have been in the van, dead. And that, so that's what's done down there. They just can't, they can't really believe it. That little girl, 11 years old, went missing last Friday evening at 4 o'clock. Uh, there's a description there. She was last seen carrying a tennis racket and a tennis ball and possibly a blue vacuum flask. And she disappeared last Friday night about 4 o'clock as she was walking in the direction of Cool Stream. She was last seen on the bridge. Yeah. It's just for you to bear in mind if you see yeah. anybody answering that description. Everyone's worst fears were realized 13 days later when Susan's body was found here in these woods, just two miles west of Utopsita in Staffordshire and 280 miles from her home in Coldstream. Now, they could tell that she'd been sexually assaulted, but because the body was badly decomposed, there wasn't much else to go on, apart from a single strand of hair. Police would wait eight years to compare that hair with Robert Black's, and by then, it was too late. In court, scientists conceded that what little hair he had left could well have changed texture and colour. Almost a year later, another young girl disappeared. Caroline Hogg was only five, but her father allowed her out to play on her own for a few minutes. She wandered from her home in Portobello, a childhood haunt of Robert Black's. She was last seen at a nearby fair with a scruffy stranger. Then, like Susan, she vanished. This spot near Twycross in Leicestershire is 309 miles from Carolyn's home. When her body was found here 10 days after she'd gone missing, the link with Susan Maxwell's murder was more than just coincidence. Both girls had been abducted in the north, driven hundreds of miles south, and their bodies left without any real attempt to conceal them. Both had been discarded within 30 miles of each other. But at least this time, the police had the first real clue. An artist's impression of the scruffy man last seen with Caroline. It turned out to be a disturbingly accurate portrait of Black. It was shown in every national newspaper, but no one recognised him. The children had been abducted in the north and taken long distances to the south, and we had not one clue as to where our offender lived. You might reasonably expect to find him in the area where the children were taken, or the area where the children were found. But as it turned out, in this case, he was from neither place. He was from London. <laughs> Down south, Black was known as Scott's Robbie. His friends and employer thought him odd, 
but not murderous. Now, when these things come on the news or newspapers, that I mean, I know things were mentioned uh, in conversation, like tea breaks. That you know, uh, Robbie was up that way that time, and it was a kind of general joke, really. Um, there isn't one person that used to work in that firm that wouldn't have shocked him if they thought it were him. But on reflection, there were good reasons to be suspicious. The introverted van driver came alive when he was in the company of young children, even the boss's daughter. I thought he was manhandling the daughter too much. He has a touch. Not touch in a, in a way bad, you know, like tickling them or throwing them up in the air, you know, if they're small enough or um, roll them over. Fine. But never with the boys, it was always with the girls. Never, never done it with any boys. I mean, I had a boy as well. Never touched the boy. Just the girls. 400 miles from Black's life in London, Hector Clark became the first assistant chief constable to head a joint force double murder inquiry. It was decided only an ACC should supervise serial murder investigations after mistakes made in the Yorkshire Ripper hunt. Clark had real problems. Two northern forces were investigating abductions, two from the Midlands were handling the discovery of the bodies, and he based the entire inquiry at his headquarters in Edinburgh. Remember also, these were the days of typewriters, not computers, the days of crumpled cards in clumsy carousels, and the days when just checking that you checked everything could take someone an eternity. In this room alone, we have the paper records amassed in the Susan Maxwell inquiry in isolation. They constitute uh, an overall tonnage, if you like, of some 15 to 20 tons of paper records for the combined inquiry and they also constitute the vast majority of some 60,000 witness statements which were collected throughout the inquiry. As in the Ripper case, the paperwork was overwhelming. For example, just following leads on two suspect cars led to 110,000 dead ends. When you consider that in the Cortina case we had to look into the owners of 25,000 blue Cortinas produced over a two and a quarter year period, and in the Maroon Triumph 2000, we looked at over 85,000 owners of similar cars, and both were red herrings. You'll see just the amount of time that was, in effect, wasted. The man the police were looking for obviously travelled a lot, probably for a living, but the question was, what roads and what living? And ironically, as the detectives from the four forces now involved crisscrossed the country, the man they were looking for was doing the same thing at the same time. I think, bearing in mind this street, the back street where Sarah went missing from, I think it's likely that the murderer had been to Morley for some reason. He may be an employee, he may have gone there to see friends, relatives, or to attend some function. I, I don't think he found Sarah by just touring around looking for her. John Stainthorpe was half right about Sarah Harper. The ten-year-old disappeared running an errand to the corner shop, but purely by chance, Black was delivering billboard posters just 150 yards from her home. Detectives would have traced him, but when the company was interviewed, they forgot to mention his call. Robert Black had the look of the devil. that Sarah suffered from was that she had rather minor bruises to her head, she had some gripping injuries to her arm, she had very, very severe and awful sexual injuries, the worst I have ever seen. Um, and these had been inflicted during life. Um, we subsequently established by scientific means that she, the actual cause of her death was drowning. In other words, she was still alive before she was put into the water and we were able to show that she had died 
approximately seven to eight hours after the time that she was abducted. There's no doubt Professor Jones's report confirmed detectives were looking for a frequent sex offender. England's most experienced pathologist also skillfully showed that the killer had dumped Sarah's body near Junction 24 of the M1. We conducted examination of the river temperatures and also the flow of river and we were able to show that by surges of the flow of water down the Trent, the way in which a body could have traversed the weirs in particular, and by looking at the temperatures of the water and the temperature of Sarah when her body was recovered, it was possible to show that her body had been trapped for some period of time south of the uh, power station where the water was very much warmer and had then on a surge of water been taken down the river where she was recovered. A pattern was already clear at this stage of the inquiry. Until then, no one in British criminal history had abducted youngsters and travelled so far with their bodies to get rid of them. This was the hallmark of a unique serial killer. Not recognising it early on was a big mistake. Let me say, first of all, uh, there's been widespread speculation in the press uh, linking the murder of Sarah with other child murders. And I would like to make it quite clear, there is no firm evidence at this stage of the inquiry to link the murder of Sarah with any other murder. It's hard to tell what was lost by not linking all three cases. Certainly it meant it would be more than two years for these separate inquiries to be compared on a single computer. Who knows what it might have turned up. And the delay would have been even longer but for one dedicated sergeant who, despite his junior rank, refused to be silenced. Caroline was abducted about seven o'clock at night on a Friday. Susan, four o'clock in the evening on a Friday. And Sarah, about seven o'clock, seven or eight o'clock on a Wednesday. The difference with Sarah is that uh, she was actually abducted on the Wednesday prior to a bank holiday. So all these led me to believe that the person who abducted the children would be a non-skilled or semi-skilled worker who had some connections uh, working up north but lived or had to travel back for the weekends down south. Bob Bolt's job was to find patterns in everyday crimes. In this case, he came up with a triangle formed by mapping in the body recovery sites. Close by, unbeknown to him, was Donisthorpe a place Black used to frequently stay. It was crucial evidence in court, but back in 86, Bolt had to bravely go over Superintendent Stainthorpe's head to be taken seriously. I was so convinced that they were connected that I took my report to Detective Chief Superintendent Newton. He took the report down to the Home Office. Uh, they studied it and decided that there should be a back record conversion onto computer of those murders. At last, all three murders were linked. 60,000 statements would be analysed and cross-checked by a team of 60 people. They'd work for 18 months and feed in a third of a million pieces of information. on the road again in an incident which with hindsight might have been linked with the three murders but for two crucial differences the victim was 15 although she looked many years younger and this time she got away i was walking up the street and this blue van parked on the opposite side of the road and this bloke got out he went to went to open his bonnet and he shouts oi you know looking around ignoring oi can you fix vans took no notice and the next minute big guy come along got me from the side with my arms pinned to my side and got his hand over my mouth and my nose which I couldn't hardly breathe ready for passing out and um, I was trying to fight for my life and eventually my arms got freed because 
I bit his forearm <clears throat> and then I grabbed hold of his testicles and he said something like, you fucking bitch. And um, I was, he was trying to get me into the van and I was screaming for my mum, but I knew my mum couldn't hear me. But fortunately, a friend she'd just left did hear her. Eventually, Andrew heard me scream and he jumped over a fence nearby and um, he sort of like stopped at the corner of the street and he shouts, oh, you bastard, let her go. And the guy panics, looks up the street, thinks, oh, no, somebody's seen me, gets in his van, and uh, he drove off. Amazingly, a bank security camera caught a glimpse of the attack, but the angle was all wrong. You can just see Teresa and her friend running away, but when Black drives into view, all it shows is the shape of his van, no registration. Teresa's ordeal was investigated by Nottinghamshire Police, but Hector Clark wasn't even told of the incident. I really was in despair. Uh, I think I'd said prior to Sarah disappearing that uh, the, the chances of catching this man really revolved around him committing another offence. What I was hoping for was that he would abduct or attempt to abduct a little girl and be caught doing it. And of course, as you know now, that's exactly what happened in the borders. Robert Black visited, during the course of his work, a small village in the borders on Saturday the 14th of July 1990 and he spent between three and four hours in the village, we think, stalking young children. Well, it was really uh, a incredible piece of luck that I did see the incident happen because I'd been cutting the grass and the lower, landlord blade was too high so I stopped to reset it. But as I straightened up, I was looking towards the main road and I saw the blue transit pull in. The driver jumped out with a rag in his hand, and I thought they clean his windscreen. Quite natural. But he walked round the van and opened the passenger door. Now, at this point, I was aware of a child walking towards the rear of the van. Next instance, the child's feet were beside his. Then it disappeared. The driver was making a pushing motion to the passenger's floor area. I thought, oh, he's not putting a child on the floor. The child never appeared in the seat or above the dash, so it had to be the case. At that point, uh, I ran into my car for me, I was running with the pen. I noted the registration. I then went to a neighbor's house where I knew it was a young, a young family. There was one daughter, a young daughter, not in the house. That's well, she's probably going off with a friend. But she said she wouldn't go without asking. So I then gave the envelope and said, that's the registration. Phone the police. He then drove to a lay-by where he took the girl's shoes and socks off. Uh, and decently assaulted her. Um, placed uh, an elastoplast or taping across the mouth, put her head into a cushion cover which had a drawstring on it, and then he pushed her into a sleeping bag which he zipped up and threw her into the back of the van. She would have died, according to medical opinion, between 40 and 50 minutes later. There are a number of police officers involved uh, in the response to the call about this little girl's abduction. And uh, one of the police officers was indeed the father of the little girl. And it was that officer that discovered his daughter in those terrible conditions in the rear of Robert Black's vehicle. Black was jailed for life in Scotland for the abduction of the six-year-old. But while detectives were convinced he'd also killed the three girls, 
They doubted they'd ever get enough evidence to bring him back to court to face murder charges. I was quite satisfied that this was the man who was involved in the three murders. He fitted the bill completely. Everything that I had put in my reports, the result of my research, he fitted it completely. I was quite satisfied that uh, he was the one. We knew that Black had the freedom to drive around the United Kingdom in a vehicle. A vehicle identical or almost identical to the one that he was caught in, in the borders. And that if he was doing that, and if he was visiting the places where the three children had gone, that there was a fair chance that he was our man. And the team were instructed to go and get the evidence to prove just that. In the end, they filled a three-storey warehouse with evidence, much of it from Black's London lodgings in Stamford Hill. They turned it upside down and discovered stolen underwear, newspaper reports of the Thornhill attack, and one of the largest hordes of hardcore child pornography ever found. They also unearthed bundles of dog-eared files packed with piles of receipts for petrol and meals on the road. Black used an agency petrol card and his signed and dated receipts placed him close to all the girls when they were taken and killed. Detectives started with Susie Maxwell and plotted his precise route on the day of her abduction. He travelled up the east coast essentially. We know he uplifted petrol uh, at a petrol station at Stannington at Morton in Northumberland. Um, he then crossed the country via the A697 road which took him directly across the Coldstream Bridge at the very point at which Susan disappeared. Uh, he continued then up to Edinburgh. He had deliveries to make in Edinburgh. Also, uh, uplifts of petrol at Dundee and subsequently deliveries in Glasgow and petrol again at Carlisle. So we have a full circle, if you like, starting in the south, coming up the east, crossing the central belt of Scotland and returning down the west coast again. The evidence against Black was damning but entirely circumstantial, and I think he knew it. Six senior detectives interviewed him for three days, and he never cracked. He made no confession at all. Uh, indeed, when he was interviewed over a period of three days at Annex, he just made no comment throughout those three days. But at Edinburgh, he made certain admissions about his predilection for young girls, and his, uh, his uh, fascinations over young girls and his unusual sexual abuse and self-abuse. This is Black's criminal record, a record police never saw until after he'd been arrested. It starts in Scotland when he was 15 and received only a caution for abducting a seven-year-old and sexually assaulting her in an air raid shelter. It shows a Borstal sentence for three more sexual assaults in Scotland on a six-year-old girl, the same age as his last victim. It lists repeated house and car theft offences in London, and in 1979, following a vicious assault, his files were marked with a clear warning that he was a van driver, likely to offend in other parts of the country. Hector Clark never had a hope of getting this information. Unbelievably, the criminal records office isn't fully computerised. Offenders can only be identified when they're caught. The system can't pinpoint potential suspects. There was, there was nothing uh, that brought him to our notice. Uh, Robert Black was not in our system. Uh, in 1990, when he was arrested for the offence in the borders, had he been in our system and had we missed him, I would have been most annoyed. But the truth was that he, he had not been brought to our notice. Black's crimes started with a van journey, and that's how they ended, after he received ten life sentences at Newcastle Crown Court. But his files are far from closed. When West Yorkshire, Devon and Cornwall, and many more British forces have interviewed him about their unsolved cases, detectives from abroad want to talk to him about his visit throughout Europe. And you know, in the end, justice has been costly. A bill of millions for the taxpayers, years of anguish for the parents, and scars that will probably never heal for the man who led Britain's biggest ever manhunt.
I didn't know the girls, but I feel as though I did. Yes, I think about them. And uh, it's no exaggeration to say that since 1983, not a day of my life has passed without me thinking at some stage about those girls and those parents and this investigation.